in your email um, um, to, to do that process. And we're just going to get started. And can, can we get the doorbell off as people join? Great. The doorbells, I think, going to come off. And, um, and we have a really, really great call plan tonight, everyone. We have some phenomenal uh, long haul organizers and movement leadership here tonight to, to really share some, some lessons in this uh, super, super historic moment. And so I think part of the reason so many people are joining is because we need this, this bridge between what's happening right now on the streets and in communities all over the country and all over the world and um, and with our history and for Project South, you know, history is critical and it is sort of the continuum that we're building from. So we'll get started in about a minute, but um, just so thrilled to have everybody here. Somebody just raised a question. Uh, is this being recorded? Yes, 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 it is. And um, and thanks for the question. We'll we'll cover that and some of the logistics um, in in just a minute here. Just got a lot of people still joining, filling up the the virtual room here for this virtual dialogue. We have lots of folks still joining, but and and other folks who aren't on with us on Zoom are are tuning in on Facebook Live. So we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. We are thrilled to be together tonight in this historic moment for this virtual dialogue facing opposition forces. And so this is a um, a really special moment to bridge some of the uh, historic uprisings and, and organizing work that's happening across the country and across the world with our, our movement history. And we have some real long haul movement organizers and movement leadership who've been doing this work for decades who are really gonna share their lessons from fighting the Klan, Cointelpro, dictators and militias and, and all of the different opposition forces we've been seeing out there on the street and just we know are, are part of the opposition to making the type of uh, human rights and social justice, economic justice, racial justice changes that we here on this call are all committed to. There's some folks who want the status quo, they benefit from the status quo and, uh, and they utilize their forces to resist what we're doing and we're here uh, to learn um, from our elders more about how we can sharpen our strategies and tactics in this, in this very important moment in our history. So my name is Emery Wright. I work for Project South. We are one of the hosts of tonight's call along with the Southern Movement Assembly. This is really part of the Southern Movement Assembly's programming uh, um, as part of the Southern Spring. And so the Southern Movement Assembly is a, is a movement force. We've been building our power and growing since 2012. And right now we're gearing up for uh, what's, what's really one of the most uh, um, historic Juneteenth that we, we've uh, ever seen, uh, which will take place tomorrow. And Juneteenth is one of the big days of action within the Southern Movement Assembly along with World Refugee Day the following day, 
uh, two days from tonight um, is on Saturday. And so we'll talk more about that towards the end of the call. But I um, uh, work for Project South here in Atlanta. I've been involved with organizing and movement building for most of my adult life and, and, and youthful life. Um, and just, we are thrilled to have all of this coming up on 200 participants on the Zoom and um, hundreds more on the Facebook Live uh, to be joining together um, in this moment of, of massive change. And uh, in many ways, the changes we're already seeing taking place and the changes that are, are being now made more possible are, are changes that are being driven by young people who have flooded out on the streets to uprise and to say, really, enough is enough. We are not going to um, live with this sort of um, inhuman system, this racist, inhuman, capitalist, imperialist system anymore. And so um, for that reason, I'm so glad to be co-moderating tonight's panel with my coworker and collaborator in the struggle, Amari Sutton. So I'll pass it to you, Amari. Yeah, cool. Hey, everybody. My name is Amari. Uh, I use they, them pronouns. Um, and I am, as Emery said, also an organizer. And I would say a young organizer, whatever that means, uh, with Project South. Um, I care about a lot of things and I do a lot of things related to what I care about. Um, recently graduated, trying to find my place in the struggle against capitalism, white supremacy broadly. That's why I love Project South, because those are my folks. Um, but really everything I care about comes back to this idea of a protracted and principled struggle. Um, and wanted to see that continue to unfold here in the United States, um, particularly as it relates to black liberation, um, but also just across like colonized communities broadly. Um, and I especially wanna lift up my black queer and trans community in all of this. Um, and so I wanna reiterate Emery's point and really commend my peers, uh, the young folks who have given themselves in many ways to the struggles in all types of ways. Um, but I also know that um, there are those who have come before us that we should be leaning on and vice versa in this struggle, right? Um, and so I kind of want to move into the goals of the call. Um, just to reiterate, um, one of our goals is to understand what we can take away from our elders um, who have already been through a lot of the stuff that we're facing today. Um, another one is to understand, understand the ways that counter organizing has stayed the same and perhaps changed so that we can st strategize and shift accordingly. Um, we also want to share and connect our experiences across generations um, so that we can create a more well-rounded stroke, well-rounded picture of how we can continue moving forward in the struggle against white supremacy and against state violence. And also to prime actions and celebrations that we will uh, see unfold um, across the country for Juneteenth weekend, weekend and beyond. Um, so yeah, that's just a little bit obviously about myself, but also about why this conversation is really important and why I'm really glad to be uh, helping host this conversation tonight. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Amari. And yeah, this is gonna be um, a, a really uh, super great call. We already have uh, over 200 people on Zoom and, and more people joining on Facebook Live. Uh, so another co-sponsor of this call and really the, the force uh, behind this call, if the truth is told, is the National Council of Elders. So uh, Project South has been working with uh, the National Council of Elders for uh, many years at this point and, and are really intertwined in many ways with the council beyond being a fiscal sponsor and, and lending some facilitation support for their planning meetings. Uh, two members of um, our board of directors are, are part of the National Council of Elders. Uh, as a sister organization, we meet weekly as part of the Southern Movement Assembly Governance Council. Um, and, um, and it's just a really dynamic relationship. And, and again, the force behind this phone call or this virtual dialogue tonight. And so um, just big respect and big appreciation to uh, the National Council of Elders who are going to be speaking in various sections of tonight's agenda, but also for just the work um, of that organization um, in making this, this virtual dialogue possible 
and so much other important work in our region possible. Yes, um, big thank you to y'all. Um, and I just want to walk through some logistics real quick, just so we're all on the same page. Um, again, thank y'all for joining um, 223 folks in uh, this space right now. So thank y'all for that. Um, we announced that um, we have almost 700 people registered for this call and we kind of got to cap our, our, our attendees at 500, not our rules, somebody else's rules, unfortunately. Um, and so if you um, could use um, our Facebook Live or send out our Facebook Live, if um, other folks want to join and you know that folks are trying to get in and can't get in, uh, just direct them to our Facebook page um, at Project South ATL um and they should be able to view everything from the live um we are looking forward to an interactive conversation in the last half hour of this um uh webinar today so please post your questions and comments in the chat box and uh we will have uh folks uh kind of synthesizing questions so that we can uh give them to the elders um and not give them ten thousand questions but kind of uh <laughs> getting all of our questions and figuring out where we can combine them at um, so yeah, send that over just throughout the call as they come up. Um, we will also share resources and links um, to tools throughout the call. If you would like to share your own resources or opportunities, please post them in the chat box. We are here for collectivizing knowledge. Please share what you know with us and vice versa. Um, and if you're on the phone, please send any questions or follow up to info at southtosouth.org. Um, we are recording this. We will be recording the call and saving it. We will have, um, we have some note takers on the line right now. Thank y'all for that. Um, they will be sending out transcript or we will be sending out transcript of the notes as well as the conversation tonight. And what else do I need to say? We will also be sending out a uh, list of resources as well following this call that will be based on some of the resources that y'all put in the chat. So just know that like, again, we're here for uh, sharing and connecting our ideas, our knowledge, et cetera, and we will follow up in that way. Um, if you are using social media, which we hope you are in the safest way possible, please post and share uh, using the uh, hashtag Southern People's Power um, just so that, you know, folks know what's up. Yeah. Does that make sense to everybody? I'm just going to assume with a lot of head nods that we can move on forward. All right, cool. <laughs> yes, yes. And although we don't have simultaneous interpretation on, on tonight's call, this transcript will be translated to Spanish. And so that will be made available to everyone. And so, uh, we apologize for not having it live tonight, but we will definitely be able to get the information out um, in at least Spanish um, to Spanish speakers after this call. So I really have the honor um, to introduce Al Josie Aldridge Hardy. And uh, Al Josie is somebody who is not only a part of the National Council of Elders, but is somebody who was, is an educator, an organizer, and a longtime activist of many decades. Al Josie was one of the key leaders within the Institute of the Black World uh, here in Atlanta in the 1970s and 80s. And really uh, the Institute of the Black World is, is not lifted up as much as I believe it should be as being one of the critical vehicles within the black radical traditions of the US South to really continue forward our, our movement struggle. Um, Al Josie is also an SMA uh, member and um, and just somebody who um, we get encouragement and strength from as a part of the Project South family. And so without uh, further ado, I will pass it to my sister Al Josie to give us some grounding. Thank you, Emery. I'm going to ask you to please join me in invoking the wisdom, the guidance and the protection of the ancestors. If you want to close your eyes, you may or just get at peace. You may write me down in history with your bitter twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still like dust, I'll rise. Maya Angelou. If there is no struggle, 
there is no progress. Those who profess to favor freedom and yet depreciate agitation are men who want crops without plow plowing up the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. This struggle may be a moral one, or it may be a physical one, but it must be a struggle. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. Frederick Douglass. We have to do what I call visionary organizing. We have to see every crisis as both a danger and an opportunity. It's a danger because it does so much damage to our lives, to our institutions, to all that we have expected. But it's also an opportunity for us to become creative, for us to become the new kind of people that are needed at such a huge period of transition. Grace Lee Boggs. We are the ones we've been waiting for. June Jordan. A new America still needs to be born. Let us be the midwives. We are building up a new world. Builders must be strong. Vincent Harding, Ashe, Amen, and so it is. Thank you so much, Al Josie, for that grounding and, and again, grounding in our history um, of struggle. So I'll pass it to Amari to sort of frame the agenda for tonight's call. Mm -hmm. um, and so I guess I kind of just want to reiterate why we're on this call. Um, we are in a revolutionary moment within the movement for Black life. It is not only a moment where this movement has called national attention to the need to dismantle the police and larger carceral systems that have kept our worlds gelled up, but it is also a moment in the movement to liberation that is calling for a major redistribution of power back to the people. And so we need our movement to be intergenerational, intergenerational um, and to have these conversations. Um, and some of the questions I have, what knowledge of the political landscape do our elders have and how can we not make the same mistakes that might have been made in the past? Um, we recognize that many of our movement spaces um, need to be prepared for counter organizing. Um, and this is due to the fact that the police and the federal government have access to, to technology and other resources that can infiltrate and easily, well, have infiltrated and imprisoned members of our movement, right? Um, and we also see that Trump has been basically tweeting out all calls for both the military and citizens to pick up arms in order to quell direct actions. Um, but we also recognize that we cannot continue to move to move as if threats like Quantel Pro and white supremacist violence, whether from the police, military, or vigilantes, do not exist. We do not need a repeat of what happened to many of our leaders in Ferguson who have either died or gone missing in the recent years. We can begin to prepare ourselves for principal struggle and counter organizing that we know will come and has already reared its head. Um, and so there's a little bit of framing about why we wanted to do this call with y'all tonight. That's great, and that's exactly right. So, so to the to our incredible movement veterans, and really, um, veterans makes it sound like they're they're they've stopped what they're doing, um, and um, they are in um, some some very active um, what I want to be when I grow up uh, movement leaders right now, and and have been for many years. And so, um, I wanted to just kind of go through. Uh, our speakers, and, and then we're gonna go through really two rounds of questions uh, to hear um, some of the, the lessons from history. So first we have um, brother Nelson Johnson. Um, uh, all of these speakers that I'm about to mention, you can type in their name on Google if you don't know who they are and, and a wealth of information will come up. So I'm not gonna go through their official bios, but I, I just wanted to say a couple words about everybody. Um, Nelson is not only one of the founder, the founder of the Beloved Community Center in Greensboro, North Carolina, one of the leaders of the 1979 anti klan March, but is also just somebody who I've personally gained uh, so much inspiration for what principled movement, thoughtful movement leadership 
intergenerational movement leadership can look like. And so we are uh, super honored to have um, Brother Nelson Johnson with us on the call. Also on the call is my sister, uh, Glory Kilanko. And so I met Glory Kilanko uh, back in uh, 2004, right when I first started working at Project South and just looked her up because it was one of my first assignments to go meet with Glory Kalanko and, um, and, and found this wealth of history of, of um, movement work that Glory was involved in in the 1990s in Nigeria, anti-apartheid work all over the continent in the United Kingdom, and one of the founders of uh, women, the founder of Women Watch Africa here in Atlanta. And so um, just super excited to have uh, Glory here. Uh, we also have Loretta Ross. Um, and um, Loretta Ross is somebody who I definitely knew about before I knew her personally um, from her work here in the Atlanta area with the Center for Democratic Renewal, the National Center for Human Rights, and the founder of Sister Song Women of Color Reproductive Justice Collective. And so, um, but after meeting um, Loretta and, and seeing the way that Loretta rolls in terms of movement allyship, um, getting each other's back and um, speaking truth to power um, and just really, um, uh, you know, being a major force for our movement and for our people, um, it, it's just a, a big honor again to have Loretta um, joining us tonight and to also uh, hear some lessons from the deep history and again, we have short time tonight, so please, I do encourage you to um, to do some more background on our speakers and and um, and try to uh, learn from and connect with, even if possible, um, our speakers moving forward. Then we have um, Brother Gus Newport. Gus Newport has a long history in this movement. Um, is um, I won't, I won't give away his age, but has been doing this a long time. And, um, and uh, it was a organizer with Malcolm X um, and, and, um, and is probably one of the um, people alive in this world uh, left who, who knew brother Malcolm in, in a deep personal way. And so um, with uh, not only um, a former mayor of Berkeley, California, but just so much history um, in the movement over over decades, and we are really uh, just blessed and honored to have Brother Gus with us tonight um, to share just some of that history um, with us. And and again, I encourage people to follow up um, and and look more into who all these speakers are um, after this call. And we will have notes and some next steps um, based on that as well. But um, but just super uh, thrilled to be getting into the questions. We're doing pretty good on time. And so we'll go ahead and, uh, and really move right into um, the first question. And so um, I'll, I'll ask this first question and we'll start with uh, Nelson Johnson and then hear from Glory Kalanko, Gus Newport, and then Loretta Ross. So the first question really is, to do a short overview of threats you have faced, what you did and what you learned? And I know that's a hard question in five minutes, um, but we'll start with uh, Nelson Johnson. Thank you. Um, first, let me say I'm honored and humbled to be on this uh, very important call. Um, I hope we can plow some ground together tonight. Um, I was to give a short overview of threats in the time that you're working in related to the police. Uh, I haven't been working in a time where there weren't, weren't threats from the police. Uh, it's been consistent. Uh, the period that I was active in that qualifies me to be an elder was the late 60s through the mid 80s. One of the great threats <clears throat> Uh, grew out of the economic downturn. In fact, this is a funny period that we're in because we're in an economic crisis now, which I won't try to speak to. But when you're in an economic uh, downturn, this creates a greater tendency for people to be pitted against each other 
by intensifying and making use of historically accumulated racism, often black racism or, or blatant racism. Uh, and it goes something like this, black or foreigners, meaning Latinos, brown people are taking your jobs. On the one hand, it's harder to do work in that kind of period because of racism. On the other hand, if we do our work well, uh, it actually becomes a little easier in the sense that people are sharing a common reality of insufficiency. And if you can get around uh, that, uh, the racism uh, on one level, you can build uh, relationships that will join in opposing. Uh, another factor is uh, it also means that unemployed whites and underpaid whites would be more concentrated in police forces, creating a culture of racism that reinforces itself. And um, in the context I'm speaking of, it was not just the police, the city uh, mayor was the uh, lawyer for the textile mills that we were organizing in. So you can see the threats lining up. A second threat was that, that uh, was the objective coordination, a rather blatant coordination between police personnel and non-police white supremacists. Uh, when you think that many of these uh, brothers and sisters went to school together, they were high school classmates, they were neighbors who shared a common racist character, uh, when they're in that context, it gets reinforced. This cultivated a good old boy's internal culture, and don't cross the blue line kind of culture. And because of that racist police culture, uh, movement leaders, including myself, could not be sure who we were meeting with. You could be meeting with people in a police uniform, but you would be at the same time, unbeknown to yourself, meeting with Klan and Nazi representatives. So those were some of the challenges then. A third uh, challenge was the infiltration of the movement uh, and organizations by pro and uh, co -intel pro forces. And although COINTELPRO was uh, technically disbanded after the 1972 church report, it remains up until this very day. And we still experience it daily within our work. Um, so often this uh, could be a militant sounding outspoken person uh, who infiltrates and discredit and disrupts your organization, but is drawn to you because it seems so committed. Uh, and I want to just say, we have to be careful with that. On the other hand, it could be a quiet person who just gathers up information and passes it on, information that sets you up to be entrapped or attacked. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit later on to what I think we need to do to defend against these tendencies. Now, the second thing that I want to mention is what do we need to anticipate uh, and prepare for? And what are the resources and tools we need to acquire? That's our second question. Um, and I was getting ready to go into that, but I'm trying to be obedient to uh, the five minute script. Uh, and we could actually uh, dig a little deeper in what I raised but I want you to know that um, this work is very, very special in its uh, variety. And I see uh, El Joseph's hand, your hand looks so beautiful, El Joseph. Uh, so let me bring this to a conclusion. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Brother Nelson Johnson. And, and you can see in the chat, uh, there's the belovedcommunitycenter.org for more information. And, um, and thank you for that discipline on the time. I will pass it to, um, to Glory Kalanko. And the question being a short overview of the threats people faced, what people did and what you learned. Thank you so much. And um, thank you all for the opportunity to share my little experience. 
Um, first and foremost, I want to hold the spirit of all those who have been lost um, senselessly by the police and um, would um, invoke their spirits to be part of this conversation. My name is Gloria Fikilanko, and like Emery said, um, I'm a global um, activist that have been doing work, but for today, I'll be sharing my experience with you during the period of um, 1983 and 1999 under military dictatorship in Nigeria. For those of you who are familiar with Nigeria, um, Nigeria gained independence in 1960, which is also something that is um, questionable because it was a change from white face to black face that did the same thing. So um, for more than 30 years, military dictators have ruled Nigeria. So when you have military in power, let me first explain the difference between uh, military and civilian um, governance. The military does not use the constitution to govern. The military um, comes in and brings his own decree. So the military in Nigeria was being governed by what is called decree and not by the constitution. And so whenever anything goes wrong, they would come up with a new decree and backdate it so it would catch up with you. So that was the kind of um, draconial uh, laws that we were dealing with. Now, having to work with military dictators, um, I happen to be in the forefront of the formation of the five major human rights group in Nigeria that stood to challenge military dictatorship. And one of the things that we did when we saw what was going on, because the military would come up and say, your organization is banned. And so when you're banned, every activity is suspended. So we started a mobilization first to say all civil society organization must not register with the government because we have to be proactive. If you are not registered with somebody, he cannot come and tell you that you're being disbanded because they were used to banning and unbanning. So that was the first major movement that we had to put in place. And so all the civil society decided not to register with the government. So it was difficult for the government to now scuttle our work, our movement by saying they were banning us. And then another major thing that we did in terms of making sure that we are able to be proactive and build this kind of um, formation that we were thinking was going to stand the test of time was to develop various leaders in our respective localities. And after that stage of developing those leaders, we embarked on a national tour, a national tour of the country. At that time, Nigeria had 30 states. We had to bring leaders from all walks of life that we're working with because when you're working in a movement, it's not something that you can do alone. So we had the teachers, we had the students association, we had the trade unions. We went as far as organizing the unorganized sector. The people who sell on the, on the corners of the streets were able to bring them together into our fold. And so we had representatives of each of those groups whereby it was easy to disseminate information by passing that information to just the leader and the leader would disseminate it to the rest of the members of the group. And so we had representation of each of those group to join us in the countrywide tour because you cannot go to a different person's state, a different terrain and go and talk to them without talking to the leaders on the ground. So we had to go and build relationship with the, those leaders on the ground in their respective states. And then at the same time, train them on some of the things that we wanted them to do and made them to understand that this was going to be a long-term struggle because we were embarking on what was known as campaign for the termination of military dictatorship in Nigeria. And because the military did not want to go and this movement, like I said, for 16 years had to fight the military until we were able to get the military to come to a realization that the people have power. And that's why the military had to step aside. And so building on from some of the things we also learned from the ANC, whereby if, if you're familiar with the ANC struggle, it says Amanda Ngoweto, power belongs to the people. And so that was a slogan in the work that we did and making sure that people understood that they own this power. 
because we got to the point where we said there comes a time in a man's life where you must decide whether to live and live in dignity or to die for fear of not speaking up. And so at that point, we were all out there. We had no guns. The military had all the guns and everything, but we mm. were able to wage that struggle. And as such, when I hear things like um, when the looting begin, the, the shooting should start, it, it reminds me because under military dictatorship, in my struggle on the streets, the military government issued a shoot at sight order. And right in my presence, people who, were, who we had mobilized to come out were even shot in our presence. At some point in time, we had to devise our tactics to say, since the military has issued a shoot at sight order, we must make sure we don't lose our members again to the senselessness and recklessness of the military. So we had to go underground again to develop other means of um, coordinating and embarking on the struggle. And we were able to hold the country, to hold Nigeria to a standstill for 21 days. Mm. And that wrecked the entire economy, which was why uh, the uh, 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 military uh, dictator who was in power at that time um, Babangida, Ibrahim Babangida had to say he was stepping aside and he stepped aside um, in a rush without proper preparation. And that was because we felt enough of our people have died. Now we have to take control of our streets. We have to make sure that we are preventing people from going to work because people's livelihood depended on them going to work. And if they don't go to, the, to their job places, they were going to be fired. So what did we do in order to prevent them? We took control of the streets. We had people who would come up with what we, we had various foot soldiers who were assigned and each person knew their own duty and knew at what time to implement that. These are not some of the things um, that I will be able to talk about because I have just five minutes. But the fact is what I was assigned to do, I knew at what time of the day I'm supposed to carry out my assignment. And the next person knew when to carry out that because we were able to build that cadre of leadership. And as such, um, the first set of people who takes control of the streets knew that countrywide at 2 a.m., countrywide, again, I say countrywide at 2 a.m., there must be bonfires at the strategic main uh, locations, main high streets, highways, where there would be no passage of anybody. And by that time, also, we had moved all the trash cabins and everywhere to secure other corners so that everywhere is in a standstill. And then when the action is going on, we are able to prevent um, the military from coming. One other lesson that we learn um, as part of being um, proactive. Would it be possible to do the, uh, the next lesson in this next section, Ms. Glenn? Sure, thank you. Thank you so much. And um, it's, it's incredible history and so, so rich in terms of what we can learn there, even just what you shared, the short part you shared um, right there. And, um, and we got permission from our elders to just interrupt on time beforehand. I wanted to let everybody know. Um, and so um, next up, we have um, uh, Brother Gus Newport, uh, who again is um, long history, also is a board member, and we're honored to have as a board member at Project South. Uh, so uh, Brother Gus. Thank you. Good evening, brothers and sisters. I'm extremely pleased to be a part of this discussion and extremely pleased to be a board member of Project South, but also I'm on the leadership team of the National Council of Elders. Um, I'm going to try to share with you some of the experiences I went through of both police brutality and co and pro protel. I was born and raised in Rochester, New York, a city that had two race riots. In, in 1960, after I came back, I was, had been uh, drafted into the military, uh, things were in full sway. Although Rochester is in the north, police brutality was rampant. And because of the segregation, blacks didn't have decent jobs, etc. Our schools were raggedy, all kinds of things. There was a police brutality case of a gas black gas station tenant who was closed his gas station one night. Name was Rufus Farewell. And two white policemen come up to him and said, hey, boy, what are you doing? He said, I'm locking up my police, my gas station. They said, no, no, 
got no black nigga on the gas station here, and they beat him to within an inch of his life. I ended up taking on that case to get the legal help he needed and raise money for his health care. During the investigation, we found out that one of those police was an Italian guy who had beaten a nun. He went to a Catholic school to within an inch of her life when he was in high school. It shows you that these kinds of devils have no background check. They just take people who are, for the most, white supremacists, et cetera, what. A few weeks after that, the police invaded the Black Muslim Mosque in Rochester. And they came up claiming that they were there to put out a fire and help the fire department. There was no fire, and they hadn't been called. So the Black Muslims put a mosque, a ring around the mosque, and kept the police out. And as a result, the police uh, arrested eight of the Muslims, put them in jail. The fact that the Muslims don't eat pork, they only drink warm milk for the two weeks they were there. But Malcolm X got the word, and he called Daisy Bates, who was in Rochester, organized for the NAACP. Daisy Bates will be remembered for integrating the school she and her husband in Little Rock, Arkansas. Said, Daisy, I'm coming to Rochester. Who should I be in touch with? And she gave him my name. And when Malcolm called me, I was taken aback because Daisy hadn't told me that she'd give my name. We talked for two hours and it was just <laughs> eloquent. I answered every question, we interacted. And he called every night for two, uh, after that for two weeks. At the end of those two weeks, he flew into Rochester. In those days, planes landed on the tarmac. And it was a cold February day in Rochester, New York. It's cold. It sits on the shores of Lake Ontario, right across from Canada. And we're standing inside the airport, and I'm surrounded by all these white men in white shirts and ties and felt hats. Malcolm comes to the door and he says, Who is Eugene Newport? Because my, my Gus is a nickname, Eugene is my first name. I raised my hand and said, I am, sir. He said, Young blood, you got the best tap telephone in America. This is all FBI here. And the place just broke up. But he and I together walked through the airport, went to my car. I drove him to the sheriff's office. He and I had an hour's talk with the sheriff, and then they brought the brothers up to the court for trial. The trial only lasted 30 minutes. We got them out and took them to get something to eat. And then we went to the Baden Street Settlement House, where there was a, a community meeting going on. Malcolm was invited to speak, and the crowd was just ecstatic. Everybody loved it. Malcolm said to us, remember, we're all black. We're in this together. The only people that were sort of leery of Malcolm being there, I'm sorry to say, were representatives of the NAACP in the Urban League because they had kept a big distance from Malcolm. But Malcolm continued coming back to Rochester. The police were compelled to his rampant. I'd gotten to know the Imam of both the Buffalo Mosque and the Rochester Mosque. And after so many months of Malcolm coming, I lost a job. I couldn't stay in Rochester. So I applied to IBM. I went to work there because I'd been trained on those machines when I was in the military. And as a result, I got to be under the mentorship of Malcolm X and Adam Clayton Powell, the two of them were very close friends. Malcolm used to host street corner speakers. They had like a, a, a boxing ring, the corner of 125th and 7th. Adam Clayton Powell used to come home from Congress every Friday in Double Park and get up there and speak. And so I went to many things with Malcolm, et cetera, whatever else. But then later on fast forward, I applied, went to work for the Department of Labor, signed to Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands, but it took me a year to get a clearance. People from all over the states kept calling me. They kept getting called by the FBI and other people to find out who Gus was, you know? So I, came, I used to come home every weekend from New York because I was very close to my mother and grandmother. And one day, some of the skycaps came to me and said, Brother Gus, you know, you've been pretty good to us. I said, what the hell are you talking about? They said, the FBI pays us to notify them when you fly in and out of Rochester. And of course, I wasn't even aware of what Cohen Hotel was in those days, et cetera, and whatever else. While I was at IBM, I also overheard some discussions with some of my white colleagues who had been in the Navy and whatever else and found out these guys participated in the assassination of Lumumba in the Congo and things like that. When they also find out of my involvement with Malcolm X, they tried to get me to join 
the IBM uh, country clubs, and told me what kind of woman I should go out with, how I should dress, and all those kinds of things. So I finally had to leave there. Mm -hmm. Later on, through my movements, I moved to Berkeley. I was invited there to do an analysis of kinds of salaries that nonprofit people see them, whatever else. And eventually I became the mayor. But before I became the mayor, I was on the police review commission to reorganize totally the police department to stop them from using gas, helicopters, and dogs. Yes, they used dogs in a place supposedly as upbeat and 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 and, 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 and privileged as, as 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 Berkeley was. As a matter of fact, talking about privilege, I live in I live in Oakland now. They have just found in the past couple of weeks nooses hanging from five trees yep. that they're now looking at as you know uh, hate crime approaches, etc., in That's whatever right. else. We organized the police department when I was a mayor, but what that takes is a history of analysis. You got to know what made it because he police should be hired to work for the community, not for police. That simplistic thing has got to be understood. And when I was mayor, when homelessness started after Ronald Reagan closed the mental health institution, a lot of homeless came there as we reorganized the police. We hired mental health workers to ride in the cars with police, as well as to engage people on the streets. That's we right. brought yellow buses, school buses, to make these uh, temporary housing for the homeless, put uh, porta potties in them for bathroom use and put a portable shower outside. I got each one okay. of them. Yes, sir, okay, I'll right on, I'll back off. I'll, I'll wait till the next time. Love you. Right. Thank you so much. Um, and again, um, yeah, really, really appreciate it. And just on the on the note about lynchings, we have seen that, you know, um, coming back here, even um, in Fulton County, a woman found lynched um, um, and, um, and, uh, and all over the country, as you said. So it's, um, this, this history is, is, is with us here. And, um, and so thankful for this conversation. Um, I'm gonna pass it next to uh, Loretta Ross um, in terms of this same question, um, short overview of threats people faced, what they did and, and what you learned from it. Well, again, I'm honored to be on it like all the other speakers have said. Um, I first got tear gas when I was 16 years old. It was a first year student at Howard University. And since that was 50 years ago, I guess I can be called an elder now uh, because simple protest as young people met the might of the state, met the might of the things that they would do to us. And that ended up radicalizing me because I didn't come to college intending to become a black nationalist feminist. I came to college to major in chemistry, but their reaction to anything that we did was so overwhelming that they ended up radicalizing a generation of people who possibly wouldn't have, have become part of a movement work. I also need to say that I, as a young person, underestimated the nature of the threat because everything we were doing was perfectly legal. You know, pro, you know, marches and petitions and meeting with city council to try to get DC's first rent control bill passed in 1974. And this was the same time there was the Black Liberation Army going on. So we thought those were the serious people and we were the civil people. We were the people who were going to use mostly legal means in order to create change. I guess we would be, even though we had a radical analysis, we thought we were doing reform work. And in 1980, one of our comrades, Yolanda Ward was assassinated the same weekend that Ronald Reagan was elected to president. And that's when everything changed for me personally because it went from the 12 break-ins in our offices and our homes and stuff that we had endured that we hadn't strung together as the reaction to what we were doing to the actual murder of a 22-year-old woman 
with a bullet to the brain. And I also want to say that was the first, that was the year 1980, we organized the first national conference on women of color and violence against women. Because in addition to our anti-gentrification work and our anti-rape work and our anti-apartheid work and teaching people who are incarcerated and stuff, it was very hard to be a black feminist calling the question on gender in the black nationalist movement at the time. And so a lot of the people who got the memo much later and wrote books about it, we were the ones they threw tomatoes at when we went to the National Black Nationalist Conferences trying to talk about violence against women and sexual harassment and childhood sexual abuse and all the things that people lift up now. It was very dangerous to talk about these things in the 1970s because you were accused of selling out to the man if you talked about the violence that we were inflicting um, within men were inflicting on women at the time. But with, back to Yolanda's death, I wanna just point out what I learned from that. And that when they do use assassinations, it really does have a chilling effect on the people who are willing to organize and work with you. And you have to learn not to judge them for kind of melting back into their lives because they still are conscious. They just aren't necessarily on the front line. And so you have to really pay attention to that enemy within that makes you wanna call them out for not doing the same work that you're doing or feeling that they're not being taking as many risks as you're taking that kind of stuff. Because we really need everybody. We need everybody. Uh, in this movement and everybody's not ready to be on the front line. That's just, that's just reality. Everybody's not willing to, to look at people's bodies and deal with things that you have to deal with. The other thing I wanna talk about that I learned, the 70s and 80s, at least for me, was a time that we did a lot of global solidarity work going to Nicaragua, going to the Philippines, going to South Africa, seeing how people survived under dictatorships were the lessons that we felt that we needed to learn and bring home to the US. And I honestly think that a lot of that solidarity work and that learning of lessons from the global South was lost in the 90s and in and, and the 2000s where it became more like a me movement instead of a global movement. And, and we're moving towards a dictatorship and we have much more to learn than we have to teach as people in the United States. So we're gonna to have to come out of our American exceptionalist arrogance and realize that even with our history as black people in this country, we really don't know what it looks like to face what Glory was just talking about, where they're willing to just massacre you know, 400 people in a setting and, 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 and how to respond to that and what impacts that will have on the movement. I think another thing is that we can't have disposable people. In the, in, in the early 70s, the DC Rape Crisis Center where I was working, we went and started teaching black feminist theory to men who are in, black men who were incarcerated for rape. And this was pioneering. We didn't think we could do it. We were all rape and incest survivors ourselves. But these were also the brothers from our community. And we knew that the prison industrial complex was not a solution to ending violence against women. And so we really had to be brave enough to go talk to men, most of whom had been incarcerated for life as babies themselves. 16, 17 and 18 year old boys who were incarcerated for life. And we had to figure out a way to have the conversation. And I honestly say, I don't think these men learn to listen to women until they learn to listen to themselves yeah. in, a, in an interesting way, because the men who rape women outside were the men who rape men inside. And they had to learn how to really deal with that internalized oppression that they were dealing with. I don't know if I'm running out of time, out time. but hmm? 
Yes, it's about but, time. Yes. Okay, I just want to say the thing that that made me stay in the movement for 50 years was the intergenerational support that I got. Because when I came into the movement as a mouthy 16 year old with baby dreadlocks and nobody knew what dreadlocks even were at that time, there were a lot of blue eyed, blue haired, black, older black women who didn't like my nappy hair and they didn't like me, but they certainly made space for me to be in the movement, even though I bought what they call a potty mouth to, to, to these conversations and stuff. And so because Washington DC was a strong birthplace of black feminist activism, I enjoyed the support of my elders to, who, who helped me understand that even though my job might've been to turn the table over, their job was to make a place at the table for me. And, and I really appreciate that. And that's one reason I feel obligated to pass it on. Definitely been doing it and doing it for a long time. Thank you so much. Um, and, and really from this, I mean, it was so rich, it's hard to synthesize all of that, but, um, but just the, the many roles that are needed um, in this movement, the, the internationalism um, came up from uh, more than one um, of the speakers so far, and also the very real threats that are being organized on the outside and the ease it is to um, underestimate um, what is happening and, and the multiple ways it can happen. But, but knowing, and, and one thing that I've heard um, from Loretta Ross and, and, and the same message from all these people here is, is that part of how we can counter it is encouraging a call in culture and not a call out culture. And, and I think that we do need everyone um, in this and there's, there's various roles that need to be played. So I'll pass it to my co-moderator Amari to take us through this next round of uh, question. Yes, um, and I just wanna thank the, the elders here who have already shared a lot of helpful information. And I kind of want to get into question two about um, what do you think we need to anticipate and prepare for? Um, and what are the resources and tools that you think we need to acquire to, you know, continue what we're, what the movement successfully? And I can, we'll go in the order of uh, Mr. Johnson, um, then Ms. Kalanko, uh, Gus, and Loretta Ross. Thank you. Uh, I just want to mention that I saw Sydney Waller's picture on the screen. Uh, her husband, uh, Jim Waller, was the president of the union at Hall River in North Carolina. He was shot in the back by a Klan Nazi delegation in 1979 as we were organizing um, to challenge uh, the racism of the Klan and Nazis. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the work we did on the ground and draw the lessons from that. Uh, we built a national student group called SABU, Student Organization for Black Unity. Uh, we helped to establish Malcolm X Liberation University that moved from Durham to Greensboro because of our base. Uh, some of you might recall the name of Owusu Sadoka, also known as Howard Fuller. Uh, and uh, we established African Liberation Day and sent delegations to Africa, created the African World newspaper and had stringers at most of the missions. Uh, they didn't have many embassies there then because they were liberation. Uh, but one of the things that I want to speak to is that we felt a need to build unity in uh, a concentrated way in the city where uh, I live, which is Greensboro, it's about 300,000. So we set out to organize in the textile workers union. And we had powerful movements in Hall River, which is halfway between Durham and Greensboro, in Danville, in Martinsville, in Kannapolis, in Rocky Mount, 
but the biggest base was in Greensboro. And so we were planning an education conference uh, for November 3rd, 1979. Uh, I got a parade permit, worked out the details, and unbeknownst to me, the police had an informant in the Klan and uh, half of them were in the Klan or close to it. So they drove into this space uh, without a single police being present after they had committed to be there, opened the trunks of their guns, of, of their cars and shot uh, five people, killed five, wounded 10 others, including myself and then put on the most, uh, I need an adjective, uh, outrageous disinformation campaign. I had my two daughters there. They were seven and eight years old. They would print things like, these people are crazy. They brought their children and they knew there was gonna be a shootout and they hope to get their children killed so that they can get more publicity to promote their organization. We had to combat all of that. Uh, I was once in jail on a price to bond of Klan and Nazis charged with murder. And I was charged with cursing in public, which I really didn't do. I wasn't brought up that way. Uh, so what I wanna raise right now is that uh, uh, one of the lessons is that if you're building a powerful organization as part of a powerful movement, there will be a variety of uh, efforts to discredit you, to infiltrate you, uh, to uh, disrupt what you're doing. And uh, the, the tools I think will be ever more sophisticated in this day and age with disinformation really being a major part of it. Uh, no government, no ruling elite, no system of domination is going to sit back and let people gather and dismantle their operation, underneath which is the thievery of billions of dollars. Uh, we haven't even talked about the money system in this country, which I think is not properly appreciated. So that's what we found ourselves up against. So what you need to anticipate, be sure and very sure, there will be attempts to infiltrate, discredit, disrupt, and corrupt our beautiful militant transformative energy that's now flowing across the nation. But I don't want you to be discouraged when you hear me say that, uh, and certainly don't stop. In fact, if you flip the script, people wouldn't mess with you that much if you weren't doing something that meant something. Uh, there are people who are making a lot of noise, not doing very much. Uh, they seem to be all right. Uh, but do take it serious. And here are a few tips. Do your very best to promote a culture of truthfulness and honesty and integrity within your organization and within the movement. That actually will limit the access of people who will listen to uh, fraudulent stories and so forth. The second thing is to promote a spirit of collectivity and democracy within your organization and movement, always taking care uh, uh, not to say things that you don't need to say. It has to be aligned with your strategic objective. Uh, and promote the greatest clarity that you can as you develop your strategic direction and as needed uh, share tactical plans that serve your strategy. Just going out doing things because you heard somebody in another town did it is not a good plan. It has to align with some strategic objective that you're working on. Now, I want to mention three more things. Uh, on the night that five of my friends were killed, 10 of us were wounded, I was one of them. I was arrested and placed in jail and at one point, I was under twice the bond of Klanman charged with murder. And I was charged with using profanity. Uh, and uh, that said uh, a lot right there. But about three o'clock in the morning, an FBI agent and a police officer came 
and said to me that your life is on the lips of every clan and Nazi members in the state of North Carolina and beyond. You're a walking dead man. Unless you cooperate with us, you don't have a life. Um, I turned my stool, uh, I was sitting on a little metal stool to the wall. And uh, they said I had bandaged up my arms where I had been stabbed. Uh, they said that we will rip these bandages off of your arm. I was experienced, I had studied well, I was grounded in my faith. So I didn't uh, bite that hook. But I tell you, there will be people put in those kind of positions. And I think somebody was saying, we've got to kind of understand uh, our people. So some of them are going to bite it, you know. Uh, and uh, we've got to figure out a way uh, to challenge that without challenging that core of them that is part of their own humanity and is part of a potential that's still there to be unleashed and you might not be the person to unleash it. Um, so I want to say, uh, secondly, that Larry Little, who was leading the Black Panther Party, came over that night and took my seven and eight-year-old daughter uh, and uh, secured them in, uh, in a neighbor's home. He was from Winston-Salem. When I got out of jail, he came to me and said, you know, y'all are going to fall apart. Uh, he said, because uh, all kinds of things are being said, tons of disinformation. I said, somewhat naively, I don't think so. I think we are hooked up. Actually, I was more right than I believe because the study had been done. The building of respectful relationships had been done and they weren't able to break us up. We laid down the Communist Workers Party and laid down the new democratic movement. But we never laid down our relationship. Consequently, uh, on the 40th anniversary, uh, some seven or 800 people gathered here in Greensboro. We're still in conversation, and I don't even want to name some of the people where they are now in their work because it's not necessary. Uh, they're in key critical spots. We still believe that we have to guide one city. We have to build enough unity, a density of serious organization so that that city can go as far as it can go without the whole nation being transformed. That in some sense, we need that more than we need much, needed Montgomery uh, in 1966. So I'm just saying that there is a lot uh, out here that we can learn from uh, and I want, uh, to just express my appreciation for all of the voices. And I want to echo what I often hear some of my elders say when they are looking back and talking about that woman in Montgomery, that we ain't no ways tired yet. We're going to okay. do this work until the day we die uh, right. as best we can. And actually, I just want enough energy to pass a little something else along to the generation behind us. And by the way, we are so proud of the young people in Greensboro. Matter of fact, um, we've been working together all day. And I think the challenge before us is how do we walk the different pieces of our aggregate people toward each other uh, in a step-by-step -step way, building a unity out of this enormous flow of energy, unparalleled even in the 60s and 70s. That's We've true. not seen anything like this that jumps across the ocean and all of that. All of this energy is flowing. Who's going to guide the energy? That is the question. How does that energy come to itself and become transformative and take all of the ugliness that's now uh, in our country and create a beautiful tomorrow with it? That's the vision. And to do that, we have to appeal to the best in people and understand the worst, but not live with the worst. People might do anything at any moment in time, but they can do better. And part of our work is to believe in the unrealized potential that our brothers and sisters have. We don't have to stay and mess around with them all our lives. Walk with the best one. And if the engines move, 
the train is going to move. All the cars in the train are going to move. The caboose will move uh, when yep. it's linked up with itself. So uh, I want to say thank you again. I think this has been enormously valuable, and I hope we can do it again sometime. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. We do need a part two. Someone said we need a part two. I absolutely agree. We need to work on a part two. Um, I kind of want to pass the question to Ms. Glory. Um, what do we need to anticipate and prepare for? And what are the resources and tools that you think we need to acquire? Um, thank you again. And um, I seem to share a lot in common with um, my co um, brothers and sisters who are here um, speaking. Um, one of the things, um, let me let me also step back to say, um, just like Loretta, who said she was tear gas at 16, I joined the movement at age 16. And um, which is one of the reasons why I had always talked about the importance of uh, making sure that we support and groom our young ones uh, to be able to take over leadership uh, from us. Even though at age 16, when I joined the movement and started uh, doing this work, um, most of the elders that I worked with saw that wisdom in me and they supported me and put me in the forefront of doing what I, I, I did best. And that's why today I'm able to be who I am and I'm still being part of the movement. Let me share the fact that um, for every right that we enjoy in Nigeria, we have had to fight for them because um, we in Nigeria had to struggle around human rights as opposed to the civil rights movement that was um, the issue here in the US. And so working under human rights was because with military dictatorship, you had to fight for your rights, even to the extent of fighting for the right of good drinking water. So we had to fight for all of those things. Um, because of things that are happening and the fact that um, time is limited, I will touch on a few things briefly. I have been incarcerated nine times. My first um, detention experience was in 1988 when students from across the universities were shot and killed and a total of 124 students were killed. And um, the government said they were going to shut down all the university campuses and would not open them up until the students are able to pay back the cost of all the destruction of both um, public and private property. So I came out to address a press conference to say, in as much as we do not encourage the destruction of property, but at the same time, we have more value to life than property. Since the government is very interested in its properties, we are going to launch a campaign countrywide to raise the amount of money that the government will say is the cost of what has been destroyed in the nation. And we will pay back that money to the government. But the first thing I want from the government is for them to give me back one of the lives that were taken. And that started a new protest with the students and everybody, the whole country was like, give us one life and we'll pay you back. Give us one life, we'll pay you back. And so with that, big movement that now resulted from that, the government could no longer go forth to asking that the, the properties must be paid for. I'm sharing this because I've been seeing similar things that are happening and I'm hearing stories and seeing pictures on the pages of newspaper and whereby they are putting on a prize for somebody to come up and um, say who has done whatever destruction. We might be getting to that level where we would have to now campaign to pay back those things for the release of that individual who stood still in the defense of the life of some of our people that have been senselessly taken. Um, when you do this work, it comes, it comes with a prize, just like what um, Brother Nelson said. Um, human rights work comes with a prize. Um, my mother was arrested in my place and taken to detention. Attempts were made to kidnap my children from school. My father is legally blind today uh, because um, the military dictators um, shot tear gas directly into his eyes. But despite this, the movement still went on and the movement was able to be carried on because of the things that we were able to put in place. And these are some of the things that I like to share quickly. 
one of the things um, that we learned was the fact that when a movement grows that big, there's the risk of infiltrators. And you must put some level of security in the work that you do to get into the point whereby you do, you do not want to trust anybody sitting next to you for your own safety. For those who know me, I don't go in into any place and I sit with my back behind the door. I don't do it because these are some of the things that I learned never to do. Sitting down in a space and putting my back behind the door because I knew that at every given time I was a wanted person by the military because they went as far as declaring me wanted for treasonable felony, which is why I had to seek asylum. Now, in order for you to sort of checkmate the movement um, from being hijacked by infiltrators who were being paid serious money by military dictators to come and um, act as one of us and destroy things and gather information, we made sure that we had different levels of operation. We had the big group where we would meet. We had the, from the big group, we had what was known as general gathering. From the general gathering, we had what was known as the expanded secretariat. From the expanded secretariat, we had what was known as the secretariat, and we had what was known as the inner caucus. The decision body was the inner caucus. So at general meetings, we never say anything that we want to do in terms of giving out the details. All we would do is tell people that we're planning an action on Tuesday next week, but the details will be letting you know. And the night before is when we shall be telling people those details individually. Social media is good, but at the same time, it's risky. You don't plan big business. I call it big business because any serious matter that affects our lives is real big business. You don't plan it on the pages of, of uh, the newspaper or the, the, uh, on your social media. There are certain things that you must not say on social media. I shared with a couple of people that if we were supposed to be organizing any uh, uh, civil disobedience uh, today as we speak, we would be able to come up with maybe a flyer or anything and say this social disobedience is going to be taking place in Macon. And we would give an, uh, um, the time and everything of the event in Macon. Behold you, the event is taking place in Atlanta. And if we say it's taking place in Macon at 3 p.m., the event is taking place in Atlanta at 12 noon. And so by the time the forces are at, at Macon looking for us to destabilize us, we had finished everything we want to do here in Atlanta. So you have to make sure that you're not putting the actual uh, time and place of when you are really planning serious action. Now you have to, at the same time, have young people who you want to put in strategic location to be able to be the ones who are there to provide that guidance. And um, for those, for, for the details of that is something that I will say for a, a private conversation in terms of what and what uh, needs to be done by those young people. But again, um, like I said, it's important for us to know that this work um, is work that has been done before us and is still continuing and it will go beyond us. But the good thing is that we are currently participating in this movement because we don't want to answer to our children who in future would ask us, what did you do to bring about change? Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Glory. I was trying not to scream from the other side because I'm not mm -hmm. muted, but thank you so much for that. Um, yes, for the strategy. Um, okay, I'm gonna pass this question to Gus. Um, and so just to repeat the question, what do we need to anticipate and prepare for? And what are the resources and tools that um, you think we need to acquire? Certainly we need to anticipate for you young people who are out there on the front line, they've taken pictures of all of you. They got your names, every ID thing possible. And they are watching your homes, where things start up from, and of course, they're scratching their eyes out now because never have we had a movement of this consistency. We're talking about 20 straight days of demonstrating and whatever else. And even though there have been a couple of things that they've acquiesced to, there's no slowdown. And thank goodness, because that's one of the mistakes that we made even during my time. You know, after affirmative action was passed, 
a lot of blacks thought, oh, well, we can go to college down whatever else. And they moved down to the suburbs and some things and only came back to the cities they lived in on Sunday to go to church. But Jim Lawson told us, even during the civil rights movement, only 10% of the black churches endorsed the civil rights movement. So we have to look at the numbers we have to work with and what we can expect. As I said, I was a victim of Cohen Pro Tell, tried to get my FBI records when I was a mayor of Berkeley for people who were going to write a book about me. When I got it, they had didacted out 80 to 90% of it. Now, Cohen Pro Tell is an abbreviation derived from counterintelligence program, 1956 to 1971, was a series of covert illegal projects conducted by the FBI, which targeted feminist organizations, civil rights and black power movements. American Indian movements, environmentalists and animal rights movements, and participants against the Vietnam War. And the beat goes on. That never stopped. J. Edgar Hoover, who was head of the FBI, served nine presidents. He tried his best to get rid of Martin Luther King. And when Martin Luther King received uh, the, the World Peace Award, we had a phone call at Juanita Portier's house, Sidney Portier's wife, 35 days before Malcolm was assassinated. Malcolm had come back from the Hajj and shared this story, some of the debates he had in Oxford. Malcolm was there, A. Philip Randolph, Ozzy Davis, Ruby D, four of the Muslims, Clarence Jones, who was Martin Luther King's lawyer, and Martin was on the own of the phone because Martin was in Florida, once again, jailed for demonstrating. And we talked about Malcolm, Mar Malcolm, who went to the United Nations office, was going to file a suit against American hegemony, imperialism, and colonialism. Martin said, brother, I'll be there with you the second day. That phone call was wiretapped. And when we got the wiretap for a film we're trying to do, J. Edgar Hoover overheard saying, those are the two most dangerous black men in America. Malcolm is dead 95, 35 days later. I traveled with Malcolm four days before he got killed to Rochester, where he spoke. Then when we came back, the police and the fire marshal were sitting there waiting to meet us. They accused Malcolm because his house had been firebombed. The week before, accused him of firebombing his own home. These people will stoop to no level. And so I'm saying that I'm lucky and some of us elders are lucky to be here today because the elders were there to help us and keep us from being thrown under the bus. Because we have a tendency sometimes to go too extreme and not strategize and think through all the things. We're there for you, young people. You are our salvation. You are the movement we've been waiting for. And I want to say, all that we need to do together, we need to do that. We need to stop talking about who gets credit for this or whatever that, you know, forget that crap. This is a revolution and a revolutionary time. And we got to examine, I remember Malcolm told us that Malcolm was training people. We got to learn to respect our women, our children, we got to have an analysis for what the education needs to be in our systems, what the economy needs to be. Because remember, through gentrification, redlining, and other kinds of things, we all live in segregated communities more that are not functional. And that's what brings on crime and whatever else that the police didn't use that to justify how they treat us and how they attack us and whatever else. The conditions that was created by this country which has a thousand military bases all around the world, which means if we just cut our military budget in half, we could underwrite the finances to raise the kind of community that needs to be accepted and whatever else. But white supremacy, and I keep telling people, the constitution of the United States ought to be burned and, and it started all over. We need something like the Freedom Charter that South Africa did, et cetera, and whatever else. We need to know more about the international problems. When I was mayor, because I was with the World Peace Council, I was invited to El Salvador after Archbishop Romero was assassinated. It took me over there, got bombed on by American Mark Plain. Uh -huh. uh, Palestine, I went to Palestine at the first Intifada, got locked down in Gaza, got shot at by Israeli police, and still our country puts billions and billions of dollars in there. The worst apartheid situation I ever saw is in the Gaza. When I was with the World Peace Council, I was in Portugal and flew to um, 
I can't even think of it now, the name of the country that, that, that South Africa was fighting. Um, but that particular skirmish, Cuba, Cuban soldiers, Cuban doctors, and Cuban soldiers joined arms with Angola, it was Angola. And they defeated South Africa there. And that's when the RAND started to go down. And, that's when was, and I was pleased to say that as a mayor of Berkeley, we were the first city to divest from South Africa. All these things are interconnected. The continued treatment of women, et cetera, whatever else. This country never passed uh, the Equal Rights Amendment. It gives women equal status and whatever else. If you're going to create public policy, you got to have an analysis of all these things and put forth. We got to understand what are short-term strategies that lead into long-term strategies. Organizers, we all are. But let's learn and let's go down this road as we should, together, with love and whatever else. God knows I'm so thankful for the work that you all young people are doing now. And I'm so grateful that you've got all ethnicities all across the world. A lot of white people out there right now. But I hope that they continue and stay with it. I don't want things to get better. I mean, look at it. We see Netflix giving $150 million to the historical black colleges. But what does that mean? They're scared to death. That's what it means. <laughs> right. We got our black, LeBron, LeBron is leading our black basketball players football players, and everybody's getting out there. This is a time on folks, young folks, unlike what I've ever seen. Let me say, I'm 85 years old. My granddaughter says, Papa, you're four years older than baseball. But I am so inspired right now that I'm ready to march with you all with my cane and to help strategize and come wherever young people call me to be to help them think this too. Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you. So thank, you. Much, Gus. thank you so much. I, I want to... Um, give uh, Mr. Ross a, um, a chance to answer the question as well. Um, but for the sake of time, I'm just gonna announce this really quickly, for the sake of time, and I see people are talking about a part two, I do also agree that we need to do a part two so that we can have a more um, interactive dialogue, which is what we hope for. Um, but because we are running on time and folks have had a long day, we might have to save the Q and A uh, for, a part two, um, but we are still collecting questions and things like that so that we can uh, uh, integrate that into part two. Um, so still feel free to send your questions. We just won't do the dialogue portion uh, this time around, but my bad, Miss Loretta, let me give you a chance to speak. Uh, I'm gonna give you the question one more time. What do we need to anticipate and prepare for and what are the resources and tools we need to acquire? Again, thank you. Well, first of all, I'm always amazed that a young poor black girl from Temple, Texas and San Antonio, Texas would find herself in this situation because nothing in my background prepared me for this. So I want to give a shout out to my people who come from rural areas and end up in big cities doing this work. Um, what we should be prepared for, the, the thing that dog dogs my activism, but particularly in the 70s and 80s were the false charges, false drug charges, false arrests, uh, false accusations of financial improprieties. I mean, whatever they could throw at the wall and make stick, they tried to. And so they're going to continue to do that. Uh, that's just, and particularly, I think we're even more vulnerable now with the nonprofit industrial complex than we were when we didn't have nonprofits. Right. That's and right. so I think that I really do say you have an obligation to do your work in as squeaky clean a, pos a, a fashion as possible. Don't think you can get away with the same stuff that white folks get away with because you ain't, you know, but you owe it to the people to have truth and transparency. But if you make a mistake, be the first run, one to run and tell it. Don't let some reporter come to you trying to do an expose because you did something wrong. We all make mistakes. And if you run and tell your bad news first, then you control the narrative. But if you wait for someone else to run and tell it, they control the narrative. And so don't try to be a perfect you know, activist, just be a human activist that, you know, full of faults and passions and all that kind of stuff. The other thing I wanna say is that I recognized early in my anti-rape work that the people we needed to organize were people who had a lot of internalized trauma. You know, that's what draw, drew them to the movement. 
So one of the things I'm a little frustrated at now is why we're surprised that we're having to organize traumatized people so that the trauma dominates the conversation and not the oppression. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, this is who comes to do social movement work. People who have survived white supremacy and all of its manifestations. And so we do need <coughs> healing spaces and Lord knows we do, but the movement isn't here as people's personal psychiatric spaces. It's here to end oppression and stuff. And so I'm a little concerned that we're, we're, we're so ill-prepared to deal with the fact that we are traumatized people trying to do this work. And somehow we think our trauma is the agenda and not ending the oppression is the agenda. And so that for me is concern. The other thing I wasn't prepared for that I wanna warn is that I wasn't prepared for the blowback on my family. I chose to be an activist. My mama did not choose to get a phone call from the militia you know, in her wheelchair, because she, you know, she wasn't part of what I was doing. And so be prepared for the threats to, re to go to escalate through your family, like Lori was talking about. Even if they haven't chosen to be politically active, they are going to choose, your opponents will choose whatever thing they think is, is vulnerable about you and threaten that. Your job, you know, your job's the least of it. But the fact that, you know, they can call your mama and say, you need to come to a militia meeting, the, a meeting of the Texas militia. That shook me up because my mama didn't sign up for this. <laughs> you know? and, and so I had to really judge whether or not and have different conversations with my family, too, because they always thought that I was a little crazy, but they hadn't realized that my crazy was going to change how they were in the world. Um, I want to quote Alicia Garza, who I love when she says, we need to make new mistakes, stop making the same old mistakes. And I think we make the same old mistakes because we as elders have not transmitted as much history and particularly the personal failures as much as we should. But also, I think there's a tendency for people to think that anything that happened before they woke up doesn't matter. And so we're going to have to figure out how we can actually make what they call new mistakes and not old mistakes. The other thing I want to say, uh, two more things I want to say, because I know we're running out of time, is that we've got to really believe in the slow arc of justice. I know a lot of people are active right now thinking that the revolution is going to be tomorrow. I swear, I thought the revolution was going to be tomorrow too when I was young. And then people who don't have that expectation met are the first ones to become cynical and believe that it ain't gonna happen at all because it didn't happen according to the timeline they expected it to happen on. And we have to tell them that all you could do, uh, I think, uh, Deborah Small, Smalls is the one that says, you are not the entire chain of freedom. All you can be is the strongest link in the chain. And so stop expecting that the whole revolution is going to happen on your watch, because it's not. It, you can just stand on somebody's shoulders. And I'll close by saying, it took me a long time to find that unifying idea and value. And for me, it was something that Frederick Douglass has said, and Malcolm X has said, and Martin Luther King has said, and that is that we're not in a civil rights movement, we're in a human rights movement. Right. <laughs> you know, we're fighting right. for the human rights of the world. And I know we're now talking about, you know, the white people who come to our demonstrations and put their bodies on the line and people are poo-pooing that and all of that. I remember being down in El Salvador and the people of El Salvador asked the Americans to put our bodies in front of the bullets because they knew they wouldn't shoot Americans, even though they didn't care about shooting Salvadorians and stuff. And so sometimes you got to step up and sometimes you got to step back. And, and really understand that there's so much oppression going around that all of us can work on it in a different way and never run out of oppression.
And so that's part of what I wanted to close with. Thank you. And it's really, uh, yeah, knocking it out of the park. Um, and as we can see in the chat, just so much appreciation to all of the elders um, and for just sharing this space together. This, this is a multi-generational space um, from uh, several different generations. And, um, and it's just been incredible. This is part of the Southern Movement Assembly Southern Spring. This is a hit towards Juneteenth, which is tomorrow. Juneteenth, uh, Project South and the Hunger Coalition have been celebrating Juneteenth for decades. And, and it is about lifting up our history. And that's what tonight's conversation has been about. It's about remembering our history so we can carry um, these lessons forward. And again, not make um, the same mistakes. Let's make some new mistakes as both Loretta and Alicia Garza and, um, have said. And um, so uh, this has really been incredible. On the international question, we have our partners, Project South, in terms of sister social movements we work with um, in terms of the Lucha movement and the Democratic Republic of Congo are part of this call tonight. So this is an international call, uh, mm -hmm. Yanamar in Senegal. Um, is, is part of this call tonight. And so many um, friends and allies and, and also elders um, on this call um, who aren't speaking, but who've, who've carried this work forward as well. I see my brother Ruben, Dr. Ruben Solis on the call. I'm an elder of mine. And um, we are really just uh, thrilled to be here and, um, and be um, having this space. And as it's been said, we need to have a part two we will definitely get the notes out from part one. And, um, and to everybody who's registered, we'll do a bit of a synthesis and um, go towards uh, also these next steps we have in terms of um, uh, the Southern Spring. After tomorrow, it's World Refugee Day, which is another big hit that Women Watch Africa has been uh, holding for the Southern Movement Assembly. And so in the coming days, there's ways to plug in uh, go to hashtag Southern Spring to find out more um, information and, um, and just thank everybody for the work that we are doing together uh, for being part of this, um, this virtual dialogue facing opposition forces, but really just building movement for the long haul and what it takes. And uh, we, we just uh, lift up and thank you so much to our elders uh, for sharing the information and just for how y'all role um, is, is just really fuels us because no matter what y'all have gone through and we, we, we've heard that we go through some hard things, y'all's presence and y'all's um, really uh, revolutionary love makes me know that through the struggle, it's still a worthwhile struggle and, um, and that we, not to be scared, um, but just to be, um, to let's remember, let's collectively remember. So I'm gonna pass it uh, to my co-moderator Amari to, to close us out for tonight. Yeah, um, again, like just to repeat everything Emery said, absolutely. I just wanted to um, highlight again, um, if folks wanted to, please send your Juneteenth actions into the chat um, so that we could just see what's going on across the, I know this call spans the United States. So um, just wanted to get the larger picture there. Um, and if you're in Atlanta, I don't know how many folks are in Atlanta, um, come out to Nine Gammon Ave, um, the Mutual Aid Liberation Center for our own Juneteenth caravan um, that will be happening, especially in the wake of Rashad Brooks' murder. Um, so yes, please uh, post your Juneteenth actions in post under Sun the Spring, use the hashtags. We wanna know what's going on so that we can help support y'all wherever y'all are as well. Um, and just to remind folks, we will be sending out um, the notes as well as um, the transcription of this call tonight um, in both English and Spanish. Um, so you can look forward to that. Um, and there will be um, some resources that will be sent out as well. Um, just that we've been collecting throughout the chat as um, and just our own resources as an organization and with all our partners and and resources will be coming your way, period. Um, I just want to say thank you again to um, just the elders for being here. Like I really love these conversations. I um, really value what y'all have done and the, the path that y'all have set and the ways that we can learn from y'all. 
I really hope I I couldn't sc scroll through all of the the faces here, but I really hope there was a bunch of young people here. Um, and I just want folks to know that like what we are dealing with today is not new. That is what I be trying to talk to people about. Like y'all, there there are ways that we can learn from the past and use what we we need to use that knowledge today. Um, to move forward and just trying to get that revolutionary ethic that I know a lot of y'all have back into um, back into young folks because I feel like it's missing a little bit, but we getting there. Like Gus said, there's a huge energy happening right now. We are getting there, we are getting back on track and I can't wait to use the knowledge that I've learned here um, to get us back on track and to get us moving where we need to go. Um, so with that, I'm really terrible at closing y'all, but thank y'all for um, attending this there will be most likely a part two we will be in the works to get that going for everybody and we'll send out the information again um so again thank y'all thank y'all thank y'all for um joining us today and thank you thank you thank you to the elders for for being here with us um and i hope everyone enjoys your evening look forward to the notes look forward to all of that it will be coming your way thank you Bye. thanks y'all you thank you the movement lives thank the movement very, very lives much. thank y'all yes. so oh man everybody be blessed and uh let's keep stepping yep thank, thank you. you we are thank the you. ones keep we've been stepping. waiting for my friends <laughs>